a while back, it must be nearly two years now, I remember Joe sent me a set of plays by this guy called Pete Nono, whom I'd never heard of. And I read them going home on the bus to, to Donegal and I just thought they were brilliant. The plays were brilliant. But I was impressed more so by his description of, of his approach and his process and his way of working with the young people. Just really impressed. I remember saying to Joe at the time, I like the plays, but I, I'm more impressed even by the process. There was an authenticity about it that I really liked. A while later I got the chance to work with Pete on the Just a Second project. I've been really delighted. It's a, a project on militarisation, which is a very heavy topic. And the, the Just a Second refers to the fact that an estimated 41,183 euro is spent every second on the military. We work in schools here in Galway. This year we're in Endes and Salerno. Last year we were in Gort as well. We try to peel back the layers. You know, it's not just about the money. Money is a currency we've agreed on. It's paper, it's coins, it's pebbles. It's collectively we agree this is a currency. But we try and look at the real costs in human terms and all the layers as human beings that it affects us. And also the cost to the earth, to the planet, to the whole earth family. But we try not to get stuck just on, on what's wrong because that can be disempowering and over, overwhelming and we focus also on imagining the alternative, imagine a world without war. Imagine, you know, that we put all that energy, all that ingenuity and creativity and resources into making peace, not war. And we look at ways in which we as individuals, whoever we are, whatever challenges we face, whatever gifts we have, whatever time we happen to be alive in the planet, and what we can do as individuals to actually help to manifest a world without war, a world of peace. Pete is obviously the drama expert and he is brilliant. It's great to work with him and it's been an education for me. I've always liked drama but I'm no expert and so it's been brilliant to watch and to get involved with, with Pete in the, in the drama and how good he is with the young people. We also use story and symbolism and World Cafe discussions, a bit of art, a bit of music, a bit of anything. The just a second of the title, as I say, refers to that, that amount of money every second, but we play a lot with the title. One of the ways we use it is just a second, stop, pause, think, what am I doing? Right? And every second is a new second. It's indicative of the process that we use, which is, Pete, it'd be fair to say you're broadly fairy and I'm broadly fairy, <laughs> among other things we are. The idea of, you come into a space and you can have a plan, you can have an idea, and you, you can have an agenda. But you have to say, right, who's here? Uh, what's the energy in the room? What do people need? What can they bring? What's happening right now? What, what, what's around us? And actually living and working in the moment. And you have then this amazing creativity happens. It is great to work with people because we've often gone into the plan and then we've abandoned it or we've tweaked it and the young people are dictating the pace. And it's, it's fantastic. It's, it's alive. I'm not going to say much about the book other than that it's a really good resource in terms of content. But I think because of the approach of Pete, it's an invite to digress, to diverge from what's between the covers and to make it your own. Just a congratulations to Pete and to really say, yeah, if, if you have anywhere you can use this book or if you know anybody who might use it, get a copy tonight because there's not many there and they'll go. Yeah. Thank you, Rose. <laughs> God for that. Rose is my compatriot and we go into these schools together and... Um, this is our second year doing this particular project. And then this morning we were down at Salt Hill um, in the sunshine, sitting on the rocks, with our feet practically dangling in the water, thinking, is this work? <laughs> I mean, really, is this? I mean, this, this is close to kind of like being a holiday. <laughs> the idea of going into schools, to working with children and working with their minds and their imaginations and their bodies and coming out of there thinking that maybe we've contributed to some process of critical thinking, and they've enjoyed it. Today after we left City Griffin Memorial and we were walking back on the beach, the, the group from, St. from Enders, they were lined up on the beach and we got them doing this waving goodbye to arms thing, you know, and falling down in the sand and getting up and falling down in the sand again, and they did it with masks and without masks. And it was, it was fun, you know, it was great. <laughs> it was fun for me, I hope it was fun for them. Um, so it's, it's fantastic and it, it's been wonderful working with Rose. She's, she's She's just fantastic to work with, and, and we have these, our minds roll off each other, and we just, she does something, and I do something, and we come up with something new, and the, it's, it's been brilliant. Anyway, these kids were doing this play, and we rehearsed it, and we were, we were due to perform it on a Saturday at this international conference, and I got a phone call saying, 
Right, a bit of a disaster. Um, there's been a car crash. A um, couple of the, at least one child who was related to three members of the cast had been killed, and we weren't sure if the play was going to happen. And I remember coming down from Galway to do the final rehearsal with the kids in Kildare, and I got there, and there were three kids missing because they'd gone. But the rest of the kids had rejigged the play, reassigned the parts, and had it all ready to go. And I just, oh, fantastic, you know. I was so proud of them and just felt, that was the moment where I really felt like it wasn't me, it wasn't my play, it was their play, they knew what they were doing and they went out and they performed it. And I think it was that year, they performed the play and we had this, a visiting speaker from a very, you know, eminent international speaker and he was, he was going to give the keynote address at the beginning and our play went on first. And they did the play and then he came out and he said, well, actually, I'm not sure what to say now because basically they've already said everything. And it was a great, again, another thing for the kids to get this kind of feedback. It was lovely. Um, we are, again, back to this morning, sitting there by the sea with Rose dangling her feet in the water. <laughs> and she started to talk about how she became an activist, you know, or wanted to, to work in the world and do things. And, like, and, and she talked about the power of story. Do you remember? Stories that you were told when you were younger. And that reminded me of another play we did called um, Jackie and Her Beanstalk. This is the first play I did with you, um, where Joe came to me and said, look, we want you to make up a play. Uh, oh, great, brilliant. It's going to be about seeds. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, okay, all right. And I, even me, I wasn't even sure if I was that enthusiastic, and I didn't even know what, how we make up a play about seeds, you know. I went into the classroom with the previous um, Deb Ed worker, Clara Brady Walsh, and she talked to the kids about seeds, and I could see them going, seeds? Are we going to make up a play about seeds, you know? I found it fascinating. Everything Claire said was amazing. I didn't know anything about seeds, you know, um, and in terms of food security and food sovereignty and everything. And, um, and I was thinking, and I was listening to Claire and I was thinking, what, and what makes an activist? What makes her? Where does she come from? You know, with this energy and this amazing desire to change things, to have an influence on things. And um, of course, it became an amazing project, an amazing play. When I discovered, and we discovered, that for instance, you know, when an army goes into another country, the first thing they often destroy are the seed banks of that country. Like we don't now, we hear about the paintings and the art and stuff, we don't hear about the seed banks. So when the Americans went into Iraq, the Iraqi people knew that their seed banks would be destroyed. These are seeds going back thousands of years to the Garden of Eden, all their precious seeds that only grow in certain parts of the, you know. They, they smuggled the seeds out, and sure enough, when the Americans came in, the seed banks were destroyed. Um, and the first rule, the first new law that was instigated on the Iraqi people was you cannot use your own seeds anymore. You're going to have to buy these new ones from us, from Monsanto. So I thought, oh God, this is amazing. So we ended up with a girl in the, in, the, in the play who goes to Iraq and helps smuggle the seeds and everything. It became really exciting. We made up this central character, just amongst the group, who was going to be our sort of protagonist. They called him John. <laughs> <laughs> this group of girls called this guy, it's, anyway, we had up this character, John, who was a lovely guy, he lived in, the, in his attic and he didn't talk to his parents, and he was a bit grouchy, and he kind of walked on the beach and, and he made up songs, <laughs> and he was kind of like a kind of weird kind of hero, you know, and during the course of the, this thing, I was thinking, how are we going to, I don't know, a group of girls here with, a, with a, a main character called John, anyway, we had a session where we were looking at um, stories, fairy stories, and one group were working on uh, Jack and the Beanstalk. And somehow, in the, in the session, it came up, the dialogue between the mother and daughter was, why does it have to be Jack? And, and the mother says, okay, let's call her Jackie. And we ended up with Jackie and her beanstalk. And in the end, we ended up with this beanstalk, as in the story, which grew from the seed, which became the metaphor for the whole story, and, and, and how Jackie became an activist then. And, and campaigning for things such as seeds, and you know. Um, and again, it just kind of shows, like Rose was saying, how you go in with a plan, and we work with the kids, and we kind of use our imaginations, and you end up with something you never thought you were gonna start with. And when we did that performance at Fela Breach, and if you remember, we, um, we created this big beanstalk, which was our metaphor for kind of something that was growing, that was powerful, from a tiny seed. And all the kids ended up in one big long line, and we sort of spontaneously ended up grabbing the people in the audience. And so we ended up with this big beanstalk which went around the whole audience, which was just, it was beautiful. Another play 
in here calling the shots, which that was the year we had Richard Moore, and uh, who, was a t who was blinded in Derry when he was 10 years old. He was shot point blank in the face with, with a rubber bullet and blinded. And he could have become bitter, but he ended up actually being this fantastic, he set up this charity of children in Crossfire, children who are living in war zones. He met the soldier who shot him and the Dalai Lama, and they become like a trio, <laughs> kind of amazing, inspiring trio. We ended up making a play there which was kind of um, all kinds of crazy things where we're inside Brian Cowan's brain at one point. We actually put Brian Cowan's brain on stage. Because at that time, um, the That's Irish crazy. Pension Reserve Fund was being used to make cluster bombs, to fund companies that made cluster bombs. And Brian Cowan was asked, how do you feel about the idea that the Irish Pension Reserve Fund is being used to fund companies that make cluster bombs? And he said, well, that's, we have to go with the shareholders. We have, to, we have to go with what makes the most profit. And he signed off on it again, you know. And um, so we had Brian Cowan on stage, or rather his, his soul and his heart and his conscience, and his, you know, it's kind of mad. There was another group of transition years there at that time, and they were from a school. She got her kids to import torture equipment that was, on, you know, was available on the net. You could, you could import it. And the girls met this Israeli guy in a park with sister after he hiding behind a tree. <laughs> and they bought the stuff off this arms dealer to prove that it could be done in Ireland. That a group of 15, 16 year old girls could buy some torture equipment from an arms dealer in Ireland, in a park. And, and since then, I think we were saying earlier that like, there's, there was a big reaction to it and um, it's been stopped. <laughs> Something's happened anyway, there's been progress on that front. And I remember at that conference, for instance, being so moved by Richard Moore and his story and, um, and then Barbara's story and the, the girls were there with her, the ones who'd done it. Um, and the power of just working with the imagination and working with, with hope and thinking outside the box and imagining a, a different kind of a world. I don't really want to say any more except how proud I am and I feel really privileged to be working with AFRI. Although I kind of put these plays together with the kids, and we performed them, and we presented them, and I felt like I was involved in, in doing it. I, I feel, in a way, there's a certain solidarity in it, this being our book, I think. It's like, it's Afri's book, it's our book. Um, and it's come out of all this fantastic work that Afri does. And I'm just so happy that, that an organization like Afri is here in this world, and they organize the famine walk, and they organize food solidarity weekends, and they work, work, work on things that are important. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you.